KTNA. Experts in apprenticeships, traineeships and work-based training. Hello and welcome to Chris & Co, the show looking at what affects business in Kent with me, Chris Price. Joining me this week is Joe James, Chief Executive of Kent Invicta Chamber of Commerce and Ashford Health and Safety Consultant Richard Lavender. Later, we re-examine plans for a £6 billion tunnel link in Kent and Essex as people nearby plead for more time to wade through documents on its impact. First, it's the news the county's businesses have been waiting for, the details of the Brexit deal. The Cabinet is still locked up discussing the Prime Minister's proposals and I'm glad to say our reporter Poppy Jeffrey is live for us from Downing Street. Uh, Poppy, what's the latest? Yeah, so I'm here alongside the world's media who are all waiting with bated breath to hear a statement from the Prime Minister, Theresa May, on what exactly this Brexit deal will mean, but not just for the country, especially for Kent as the gateway to Europe, with lots of the trade traffic coming through the port of Dover and onto Kent's roads. So hopefully by the end of the day we'll have more details as to this Brexit deal that has been proposed and what exactly that will mean for not just the people of Kent, but the business and we'll be bringing you all of the latest. OK, thanks very much for that, Poppy. That's uh, Poppy Jeffrey there, our reporter at Downing Street. Now, um, guys, uh, intense discussions here between the Prime Minister and her Cabinet. I mean, what will business owners be feeling about this intense standoff at the moment? I think, to be honest, with businesses that I've talked to, I think they've just had enough now. Um, I, I don't think anybody expected to, uh, know, whether you're, you're, you're sat at work on your computer, whether you're, uh, you're sat at home on, on your sofa, I don't think you ever expected to have a front row seat to spectacular infighting that we've seen either at number 10 or we've seen uh, in the house. And I think businesses have just had enough. Um, I think now they just need to get on and they need clarity and they just they just need clarity so they can actually uh, get on and, and plan to move forward. Um, what, what damage does this do to be, this spectacular infighting that Joe, uh, you know, you, you mentioned there? What damage does that do to businesses? Why is that such a problem? Well, I think it gives uh, it, it's the credit of your whole company and what you're saying if you're going out and talking to new customers are they actually listening to you do they actually want to know and actually your staff as well do do they feel safe or are they doing a good job for you now and not knowing what tomorrow is going to bring we're already two to three years ahead um, whether we come in come out stay or whatever we have got to plan for the future, and we already have. Our payroll has got to come in. It's not on the. Um, it's not a, a government take here. We have got to earn our money, and therefore, as far as we're concerned, we're still moving ahead, sure. and we've got to do that. But I think also, if I look at our, our results for our quarterly economic survey that only came out this week, um, it shows that business confidence is now. You know, it is continuing to form now, and you know, Brexit is now right at the top of the, of the agenda and businesses are holding back um, on investment, on employing people um, and that's not good for the individual business, it's not good for the county and it's not good for the country. So, you know, businesses need certainty and I think the thing we've noticed over the last few months um, is actually uh, talking to our exporters, uh, they're actually European customers and now starting to ask them the question, what are your plans for Brexit? How are we going to, you know, in case of a no deal, um, how are you, you know how are your goods going to get to me? And obviously, businesses look for the least route of resistance. So actually, you know, our Kent exporters are talking up the situation, mm -hmm. but actually, with all the the infighting that's going on, it's very difficult to talk up when our politicians are coming out with what they're doing. Well, ex export perhaps is a very good time to, to talk about um, some news from earlier this week, and um, which emerged that. Ramsgate Port could receive £200 million of funding in a bid to keep trade moving when Britain leaves the EU. It's hoped an upgrade to the site will help alleviate delays at Dover, which could be created by the need for longer customs checks on lorries heading to Calais. Ramsgate Port, which is owned by Thanet District Council, has been left largely quiet since the collapse of Trans Europa ferries in 2013. Yet there are questions about how much of the traffic heading towards Dover the site would be able to take. Christina Curtis has more. 
Transport Secretary Chris Grayling has announced that he is drawing up plans to expand Ramsgate Port as part of Brexit. As you can see behind me, the port of Ramsgate is empty and that is quite often the sight here. But it's one that local people desperately want to change. <clears throat> the last ferry service we had here was Trans Europa, which collapsed in 2013. And since then, the port has been losing two and a half million a year, approximately. During that time, there have been discussions with over five operators to see if they would be interested in running the service and without exception they've turned it down. There's a black hole and it's sucking ratepayers' money down it and that's the Port of Ramsgate. It's a dead lump of concrete that uh, is costing an obscene amount of money uh, just to keep it sitting in readiness for nothing. They also feel that Mr Grayling's plans may not be best suited for Ramsgate. It warrants examination but the reality is that Ramsgate is a very small port and it won't accommodate the large vessels that are used on the Dover routes. It's possible, at a stretch, that Ramsgate could handle about half a million trucks per year, but that's less than 5% of the load in Dover. So the question is, how effective is that going to be? And what economic benefit is it going to bring to Ramsgate? Even were, were the port to be reconfigured to accommodate larger vessels, there's a very real difficulty because there's a very narrow single access channel which restricts actually the traffic in and out of Port Ramsgate at any time. So it's quite important that you know, these logistics are taken into account. Meanwhile, a spokesperson for Thanet District Council said, We have been working on re-establishing ferry services at the Port of Ramsgate and are currently in discussions with a potential operator to establish a freight operation. The council has been keen to re-establish a ferry service since before the vote to leave the EU. This information has been shared with the government, but they have not responded on that basis. We recognise Ramsgate could play a role in supporting post-Brexit resilience by offering an alternative route for some cross-channel traffic to ensure at least some movement of goods should there be significant delays in Dover. But whatever the outcome for the port is, one thing they have all agreed on is that it certainly needs regenerating. This is Christina Curtis for KMTV. OK, so Ramsgate Port, a viable alternative to traffic heading towards Dover? I don't know if I would look and say whether it's viable or more or less my biggest concern is I think the government would have to move heaven and earth and a lot of silt for it, and I still don't think it would be ready in time. Um, so, you know, there, there's one concern. Even if they started now, it wouldn't be ready in time. Um, and then uh, I don't think the infrastructure is there. Um, you know, we already know uh, that if the M20 uh, has any issue and then uh, lorries and cars start looking at other routes and they go down the M2 and the A2 and then obviously we come across the issue with Brendy Corner. Um, and until the government start to really commit to give funding um, for Brendy Corner, then actually... That, that being the junction at the end to... Yes, yeah, for, yeah, uh, yeah, that, you know, mm. and, until you get the capacity there, mm. um, you know, I don't think it's going to be a viable uh, but, because you haven't got the infrastructure. But presumably we have to look at some other options. You know, if, you know, no deal has possibly never been more of a possibility than perhaps what it is now. And uh, is it understandable that perhaps the government are trying to look at these various... I mean, they also talked about perhaps using uh, the Sheer Sheerness port as well for some freight traffic and lorry parking. I mean, is it understandable that the government is exploring everything? I think that they will. They have to explore everything. However, now it's of no point, it's no, no point in doing it. As Joe has already said, the draft of, of bigger, the bigger vessels that you would have to have coming into Ramsgate to actually facilitate this would need it completely dredging out. Um, the infrastructure is just not there getting down into Ramsgate. The lorries are now heavier as well coming through. So in the long term, there's a lot to be done. The new tunnel, yes, that will be fantastic for that part of Kent, but it's a long way off. Um, we're looking at, at the moment, plucking straws out at the moment for March the 29th, and it's not going to happen on do, March do, do you have confidence in, in the kind of plans that the government is putting for, you know, we've also got this potential turning the M26 into a lorry park. Do, do you have confidence yeah. in the ideas that are being thrown out there? It's very frustrating, but, you know, you, you can't change 
what's happened you know and and, and you know I, I won't harp on too much but it is frustrating and I think everybody must share my frustration that we've gone all this time and here we are now that many months away um, and, and we're scrabbling around to look for a solution where you know if, if we'd have started that um, um, I think it's Dominic Grab and he actually said was it this week that he didn't he didn't understand how important didn't realize you know, how big a deal realize, Dover I mean, was really yeah. Yeah. You know, um, mm. that really surprised me. Mm. Um, well, it shouldn't really, I suppose. It's quite strange. If you go back um, 10 years, possibly, we sat with Paul Carter and KCC, and he mentioned then that his son had suggested that why don't you use the, the M26, Dad? That was that As a lorry ago, park. As a lorry yeah. park. Now, when a child starts saying that to his father, and we're all looking around for, for, for answers to it, now, 10 years later, we're going back to the M26. Should something have been done much for yeah. this is I, panic measures yeah. again? It is. I mean, I, you know, we, it shouldn't be about where do we park the lorries. It should be how can we keep the lorries moving mm -hmm. and the traffic flowing. Um, but, you know, if, if the 29th we have a no deal, we do have a problem in Kent. And, you know, whether our, our government's done nothing about it, which they haven't till now, you know, we do have to look for something. And, and whether that be, you know, Operation Brock, um, M26, Manston, mm. potentially something at Shinnus, we're at that point now where we don't have that many months left that we have to look at every opportunity that there is out there. But, but very briefly, in, in a couple of words, how, what is the impact on business if there is no deal? The impact on business, um, I think back to the summer of 2015. The and I'll operation leave, And I'll leave you to, yeah, to, to, so. to know well, that one. Wonderful. Guys, thanks for your thoughts yeah. on that. After the break, a plea for more time to look at plans for a tunnel between Kent and Essex. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Chris & Co, the show looking at what affects business in Kent. Well, I'm joined by Joe James, Chief Executive of Kent Invicta Chamber of Commerce and Engineer and Health and Safety Consultant Richard Lavender. 15,000 people have responded to a consultation on plans for a new £6 billion tunnel linking Kent and Essex. Yet people living nearby to the proposed Lower Thames crossing east of Gravesend are pleading for more time to wade through the huge number of documents released about the scheme so they can have their voices properly heard. Officials say the plans, which are the biggest for a road in England since the M25 was built around 30 years ago, will be a huge boost to the Kent and national economy. Harry Peat reports. Whilst the traffic controllers work hard to keep the Dartford crossing moving, bosses at Highways England are halfway through their consultation plans to help relieve pressure on it with the Lower Thames crossing. The, the whole of the southeast of England faces a huge um, constraint, which is the Dartford crossing. It regularly um, operates way above its actual design capacity and it will continue to get, become under further pressure as housing and business grow in the area. Lower Thames crossing will provide a 90% increase in capacity across the Thames, much needed um, to facilitate better, more reliable journeys across the, the, the River Thames. The tunnel could cross from North Kent to Essex, and as the consultation reaches halfway, Highways England have received 14,000 bits of feedback from you. All the responses we're getting is hugely valuable. We're at a really critical stage in the development of our scheme in preparation to take it for planning. So we're getting a huge range of feedback all around connectivity, air quality, noise, benefits, and we're really listening and we will use this feedback to shape our final design. Over the water behind me is Kent. Underneath will run the Lower Thames crossing over to this side here in Essex. And whilst the Highways England team say that this could be a fantastic project and they've received thousands of consultation feedback forms, those against the crossing said they haven't been given enough time to fully represent themselves and get their views across. Laura Blake is part of the Thames Crossing Action Group and whilst bosses say it's too early to say how many people are for and against the plans, many in Kent have had strong views against, but she feels even more could and should be heard. We find that, that the volume um, and the, the, the depth of the, question, the information that Highways England is providing is extreme. It's unprecedented amounts of documentation um, and that is very intimidating for members of the public and very time consuming. Um, we would like to see it extended if Highways England really mean what they say when they tell us that they want to hear our opinions and want our feedback then we would please we would welcome them to extend that time of the consultation because at the moment it is very stressful and limiting um, to the extent that we actually sadly have residents that feel that they they're suicidal over this because of how much stress it is on them and their homes and their lives and their health. Whilst many of you will be pleading for any help to solve Dartford Crossing's traffic Others whose lives may be affected by a new crossing are pleading to be heard too. Harry Pete for Came TV in Dartford. Okay, so should Highways England, first of all, allow more time for residents to take a look at this consultation and get their responses in? Um, personally, I think sufficient time um, is there for the consultation. Um, I, I get what they're saying around the, the sheer volume of documents mm. on this consultation and I think from uh, Highways England perspective I think that was done on purpose, um, sort of leaving no stone unturned, um, you know, e every question, everything you're going to want to know is available there um, online for the documents to read. So um, now I think the documents are there, I think there is sufficient time for consultation. There has been consultation meetings uh, where people have been had the opportunity face to face to ask specific questions so from my point of view um, I, I okay. don't think it should be extended. I, I mean, we've had people from France, the Orkney Islands, Belfast mm. commenting on this concept, 15,000 mm. uh, responses so far and we're halfway through. Um, mm. I mean it, why is this this wide-ranging interest first of all? I, I, this is not a, a just a Kent project it's happening here in Kent but it's the gateway that is going to be the gateway to the, to, if you like, the powerhouse of the north. And when you talk of the powerhouse of the north, that means onto Ireland as well, um, to Fishguard and all the other places. France, they still need their traffic moving forward as well. So again, you don't want it stored anywhere. And this has been a long time coming. Um, we can't carry on at the moment with the Dartford crossing. So as far as the report's concerned, yes, it has been out there for a long time. I think that Highways England have moved 
an awful lot towards accommodating the locals as well, the local people and objections. So, yeah, we might, I don't see that you need that much more time. The documents are there to read. Is it understandable, though, that some people may say, well, I live in Kent, I have my views on this, my views should perhaps count more than the views of someone from France or the Orkney Islands. I mean, is, is that a fair point of view to, to take? Um, I think it's, uh, uh, if, you, if you ever think who's going to be using the road, um, and, you know, has, as Richard's already said, you know, it's going to be people uh, from the places you've said, it's going to be people from Kent, people from Scotland coming down, going out to Europe. You know, everybody has a, you know, has a vested interest in, in a potential new lower Thames crossing. Um, you know, it's vital for our economic growth for the South East. Um, and actually, I think it's vital for economic growth right across the UK that we have it. So there is a vested interest. Mm. Uh, and everyone will have different opinions, whether you're local to it, um, or, or whether you're over in France. OK, yeah. thanks for that, guys. We have to move on there. Um, more details on that at highwaysengland.com if you want to, .co.uk if you want to uh, contribute to the consultation. Now, with news of a vast vineyard crop, a farewell to a food factory boss, and Lidl launching its latest plans, here's Christina Curtis with this week's Business Roundup. The chief executive of Premier Foods, which owns the Bachelors Factory in Ashford, is set to step down from his role next year. The announcement that Gavin Darby would be resigning as CEO was made when the firm released its latest financial figures, which showed losses before tax of 2.2 million for the half the year up to September. This was despite a revenue increase of 1.3% and a trading profit growth of 6.2% to £51 million. It was also announced that despite a strong performance, the firm, which produces Mr Kipling and Bachelor's Cup of Soup, are looking to sell off the Ambrosia Custard brand. Mr Darby said, Having announced a new strategic initiative for the business, I have decided to step down as CEO on the 31st of January 2019. Over in Herne Bay, Lidl have revealed plans to build a new store in the county on land near Greenhill Roundabout. Bosses at the German chain previously applied to build on the land earlier this year, but it was narrowly rejected as the site is said to provide a natural green buffer between the main road and nearby homes. Now in a fresh bid for the supermarket which would create 40 full-time jobs, the application has been amended so the store would lie closer to the roundabout with part of the site left undeveloped as a paddock area. The new proposal is available for public comment on Canterbury City Council's planning website until the 7th of December. And finally, another one of Kent's major wine producers say it has had a bumper harvest due to this year's summer heatwave. There have been a record quantity of grapes according to Gosborne, which is located in Appledore. And these grapes were said to be wonderfully ripe across all three varieties. Chardonnay, Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier. This is said to be due to superb conditions throughout the growing season and the harvest commencing earlier than ever before. The Chief Executive Officer Charlie Holland added that it has been an outstanding year across the English wine growing community. OK, so, so, so we heard there um, some news about Premier Foods um, in Ashford and, it, and its latest um, slight difficulties, should we say. I mean, they've got the Bachelor's Cup Suit Act factory in Ashford, a huge employment. Mean, how important is that company to the town's economy? I think it's very important. Um, a lot of the majority of their workforce is local workforce. Um, so I think it is very, very important. They're, they're, they're a very well established company. They've been in Ashford for many, many years. Um, you know, and I think it's vital for its economy. OK, guys, thanks for that. Now, before we go, we just have time to reveal our number of the week. And this week's number is £1.8 million. That's how much a council paid for a prominent former bingo hall which it could turn into homes. Ashford Borough Council bought the former Mecco, Mecca bingo building in a town centre which was formerly an Odeon cinema last year. The fate of the site is to be debated at a full council meeting in December with a petition to turn it into a theatre gaining 3,000 signatures. Um, guys, the council um, is apparently looking at this site to potentially turn it into homes. I mean, what, what do you think about councils using taxpayers' money essentially to buy up property and, and look at it and essentially become a property developer? 
Councils have got to start doing that and getting their own property portfolio together. When government subsidies stop and, uh, and they're not paid anymore, how many councils can actually look around as Ashford has and be self-sustaining? And that is, I think, the point uh, of taking it forward as a business. So it's, it's a change in the way that councils kind of... It's more business focus, is it, from councils? Very I think much it's so. a very entrepreneurial approach mm -hmm. um, because actually it's the... In the long run, it's the local residents that actually benefit because the, uh, the council buy these properties. So they bought, uh, for instance, the local shopping centre. They bought um, a big office building in Ashford. Um, and that gives ongoing revenue. And actually they've managed to turn what was um, a failing shopping centre to now an almost full shopping centre. The same with International House in Ashford. Uh, they now own that. That's, that's almost full. So therefore the money's coming back in. So therefore council tax is remaining lower. OK, very quickly, I mean, should councils be looking when they buy these properties to turn it into housing? Or should it, you know, is it the idea of a theatre perhaps something that should be supported? Is, you know, should councils be looking at creating things for the community maybe rather than homes? I don't when you think you have to go to Canterbury to get it, uh, to a good theatre, and do we want one in Ashford? Well, you've got to do the footfall work first. Will the people go there? Can they park there? Will there be sufficient terms? Um, and that is the main thing. You can't put it up just because it's popular. Richard, Joe, it's been wonderful having you both on the programme. Thanks so much for coming on. That's it for the, latest, the, for the latest edition even of Chris and Co, our show looking at the issues affecting businesses in Kent. Keep up to date at kentbusiness.co.uk. But for now, thanks for watching. Have a good night. Bye bye. KTNA, experts in apprenticeships, traineeships and work-based training.